Corporate Communications at the Central Bank of Barbados, and a warm welcome to this news conference at which our Governor, Mr. Cleveston Haynes, will update the country on Barbados' economic performance for the first three months of 2020 and share with us his prognosis for the rest of the year. Governor Haynes? Thank you, Noveleen, and good day to everyone. Today, I share with you an overview of Barbados' economic performance for the first three months of 2020 and outline the prospects for what promises to be a very difficult year. During the past three months, we have witnessed a dramatic change in the local and global economic and financial landscape. The deadly coronavirus pandemic has spread rapidly, forcing countries to adopt various restrictive measures, including closing their borders temporarily to international travel, enforcing public orders to shut down businesses, and for persons to remain indoors. The pace of global economic activity has slowed considerably, with the sharp decline in international travel, depressed business activity, and disruption to global supply chains. An uncertain international economic environment has emerged, leading to declining oil prices and volatile financial markets. These developments have adversely impacted the Barbados economy, which was previously expected to build on the gains of 2019, recording modest economic growth, continued fiscal consolidation, and further accumulation of international reserves. Instead, while the gross international reserves grew by 94 million, and the government achieved the targeted primary balance surplus equivalent to 6% of GDP for fiscal year 2019-2020, Rail economic activity contracted by 3% during the first quarter of the year, as the sharp decline in tourism negatively impacted other key economic sectors. Furthermore, the forecast of a global economic recession during 2020 has now materially changed the economic outlook and the domestic policy stance for the remainder of the year. First, the impact of the virus on the domestic economy threatens to be severe. The cancellation of global business and personal travel with the attendant effects on airlift and cruise visits to Barbados has already curtailed tourism activity and is having a negative spillover effect on ancillary sectors. The hotel and restaurant sectors have been hard hit as closures have resulted in a loss of jobs and earnings. However, there has also been a compression of incomes elsewhere, including in the tourism-related transportation and leisure sectors and in sectors affected by government-imposed restrictions on business activity in an effort to quell the spread of the virus locally. Over the past five weeks, unemployment claims of over 29,000 have reached unprecedented levels, partly because of temporary layoffs associated with the restrictions on business activity. The extension of unemployment insurance will temper the impact of these lost jobs on spending in the short run. But individuals may also have to rely on domestic savings to compensate for lost earnings. The full measure of these developments on economic activity is uncertain, as the timing of the resumption of international travel and the speed of recovery cannot be predicted with certainty. Preliminary forecasts of negative growth of approximately 8% for 2020 were based on a relatively swift recovery of the tourism sector. But given the deepening of the global health crisis, there is now increased likelihood of a double-digit decline in economic activity in 2020. However, investment projects currently underway and those expected to come on stream once the economy reopens, together with a moderate increase in public sector infrastructure spending, can help to cushion the effects of the broader downturn this year and strengthen growth prospects for 2021. Secondly, the reduced economic activity will depress government's revenue in fiscal year 2020-21 and result in increased spending by government and temporarily shift the public finances away from previously targeted 6% primary balance. This policy adjustment is unavoidable given the size of the external shock and the need to dampen the adverse effects of the crisis through increased health-related expenditures and counter-cyclical measures in the form of income support compensatory transfer, transfers for state-owned enterprises impacted by lower revenues and higher capital spending. The deterioration of the primary balance will cause a deviation away from the plan to reduce debt in the short term. Government, however, 
remains committed to achieving a 60% debt GDP ratio by 2033, and a resumption of fiscal consolidation efforts is anticipated over the medium term as the economy rebounds from the shock. In this regard, government is in ongoing discussions with the International Monetary Fund to modify current year program targets and to augment resources under the extended fund facility. Unlike earlier IMF resources that were used solely to help build international reserves, these additional borrowings will be used as budgetary support to help reduce the financing gap created by a smaller primary balance in fiscal year 2020-21. Thirdly, the loss in foreign exchange earnings from tourism will weaken the external current account. However, the buffer of international reserves of 19.4 weeks of reserve cover accumulated over the past 18 months remain more than adequate to meet external obligations, including for external debt. In addition, government has engaged the international financial institutions to provide additional budgetary support, and these resources will also buttress the international reserves during this period. Fourth, the contraction economic activity will impact the financial sector. As businesses and individuals adapt to the slowdown, non-performing loans are expected to increase, and financial institutions will need to work with their clients on a case-by-case -case basis to restructure existing loans and provide new credit where applicable to ensure that firms ride through the storm and are capable of growing in the future. Monetary policy had remained unchanged since late 2018 in an environment of excess liquidity and low interest rates. However, to assist financial institutions that may encounter periodic liquidity shortages, the bank has signaled a more accommodative stance, lowering its discount rate to 2% while freeing up liquidity for these institutions. What is the way forward? This is an unordinately large economic shock that is ravaging economies large and small. What was initially a health issue has evolved into a major economic challenge. Some countries have introduced extraordinary measures to attempt to minimize the adverse effects of the crisis. Initially, our response has been perhaps more measured, but as outlined by the Prime Minister yesterday evening, more aggressive action is needed to address the crisis now. The commitment to fiscal discipline and the reserve buildup over the past 18 months will certainly better enable Barbados to continue to meet the challenge. This situation, however, underscores the need for larger buffers to safeguard the economy against its vulnerability to large shocks that may be caused by climatic events, pandemics such as this, or crises that undermine global financial stability. The IMF, the World Bank, and other international financial institutions have begun to take decisive measures to help countries cope. We look forward to further changes in the global financial architecture that address the issue of vulnerability and very small middle income open economies, which are often marginalized. Our efforts so far have been focused on addressing healthcare issues and on trying to stabilize a very difficult situation. Our economic focus has been to provide directly or indirectly support to individuals and corporates, and to safeguard our financial institutions through our regulatory policies. As we seek to rebound from this crisis, we have to facilitate increased public and private sector investment that enables persons to return to the world of work while allowing the key tourism sector to recover from this shock. We have to examine how we can strengthen our small business sector through business development support and improve access to credit and technology where necessary. We have to enhance productivity so as to improve the competitiveness of the economy, create jobs, and earn foreign exchange. Our measure of success cannot simply be how quickly we get the economy growing again, for the world is likely to be a different place. Rather, we need to take advantage of the opportunity provided by the crisis to refocus and to accelerate our efforts at economic diversification. This is absolutely necessary if we are to make our economy truly more resilient to external shocks. First, we will have to address the issue of food security friendly. Food imports in 2019 accounted for $658 million in foreign exchange flows. Reducing this leakage through increased consumption of domestically produced food 
saves foreign exchange, creates opportunities for agro-processing industries, strengthens into industry linkages, and equally importantly, creates a platform for enhanced food security. Our challenge will be to incentivize farmers to produce quality crops in a secure environment on a reliable basis at competitive prices, but it is a challenge from which we cannot resile. Second, we have to accelerate our implementation of alternative energy. Government's 2030 goal of a fossil-free economy appears ambitious, but it is necessary from both environmental and economic perspectives. The upfront costs may appear significant, but the payback is worth it at the individual and the national level. We therefore have to ensure that any hurdles to implementation are urgently addressed. Thirdly, we need to capitalize on the potential of the digital economy. The shutdown of the domestic economy has forced several persons to operate from home. Businesses and individuals have demonstrated immense adaptability in a relatively short period of time. We have witnessed the emergence of new businesses in the area of food delivery services and the repurposing of existing businesses. This is encouraging and augurs well for economic transformation, including through enhanced digitalization of economic activity. We must now leverage these gains by taking advantage of our human resources to build e-commerce platforms and web pages, etc., thus creating greater domestic value added. In the financial services sector, the disruption in economic activity has led to a sharp increase in direct payments by public and private sector entities through the ACH. We are working to make these payments real-time and anticipate the imminent membership of two credit unions to the ACH. This is part of a broader initiative to make the payment system faster, more accessible, and more competitive. The transition from paper-based payments to electronic payments will ultimately enhance efficiency and productivity, which we required in a more modern economy. And fourthly, we need to ensure through our educational and training systems that our labor force is adaptable. Some jobs lost may never return. We need to ensure, therefore, that the labor market is characterized by a balance between the demand and supply of skills. Before I close, let me salute all frontline workers who have been caring, supporting, and serving us in the midst of COVID-19. The bank thanks all of you. I thank you. And thank you very much, Governor Hayes, for that synopsis so of the Barbados economy over the past three months and, of course, the outlook for the rest of the year. I want to welcome the journalists who are joining us remotely this morning. A warm welcome to you. And uh, let me say on behalf of the bank and indeed the entire country, thank you so much for the hard work you've been putting in in keeping us informed about the developments related to COVID-19. I invite Ryan Broom of CBC to pose the first question. Ryan? Good morning, Novelin. Good, good morning, Governor. Now, Governor, you mentioned that the domestic economy is going to take a, a heavy blow uh, from this situation. And I'm just wondering if, in addition to some of the things that you said just now, I know that restructuring has come up with the conversation. Has debt forgiveness or partial debt forgiveness come up as well? Is that something that we won't have, don't know when next we will see some of the weapons? I'm trying to see if I understand your question. Are you asking if we are contemplating further if, debt restructuring? If, if in terms of our, in our creditors, if, if the, the conversation of debt forgiveness debt has forgiveness. come up with debt, or is it more or less right now with just for debt structure? Either debt forgiveness or, or partial debt forgiveness, or is it more, is the conversation more at this stage just centered on debt structure? I think, as you know, we have just gone through a major debt restructuring. Uh, from the, the, the Barbados um, <clears throat> perspective, the issue of uh, further restructuring is certainly uh, not something that we are looking at. Uh, what we would like to see, and this is more from a, a global perspective, and, and this is why I, I spoke of the issue of the global financial architecture, because as you would appreciate, a lot of the debt forgiveness and so on that is taking place is 
catered solely towards the smaller uh, economies, when I say the smaller, the, the very low income countries, those which are considered to be IDA uh, based countries. But there are, I think, for middle income countries also, which are subject, which are very vulnerable to the various shocks, and not only to this type of economic shock, but also vulnerable to climatic shocks. We do think that there is need for uh, a, a rethinking of how these countries are approached in a general sense, and this is not just specific to this pandemic, but rather to how one treats with the middle income countries, uh, particularly small open economies like our own, because in, in many cases we have been, for example, graduated, and therefore some of the low income loans that you might get from institutions like the World Bank are not available uh, to countries like our own. So what we would want to see really is for the global financial architecture itself to be revisited to make sure that we do not marginalize uh, small open economies like our own, which are very vulnerable, and, and, and I think that this economic shock has demonstrated it uh, conclusively, very vulnerable uh, to these types of, of, of shocks. And, and the impact of one sector in our case uh, because of our, our heavy dependence on tourism, the impact on, of that sector on our economy uh, throws the, the whole landscape into a, a different look. You know, when we met uh, three months ago, we were arguing about how much the economy would grow by. Now it's a question of how much it will decline by because of this, this major shock. So from our perspective, what we want to see is the, the global architecture being revisited uh, to address the, the concerns of middle-income countries like our own. Hi, G Governor Haynes. Marlon here from Barbados today. Um, could you give us an idea if we should expect any additional measures um, post-COVID to help enhance government's uh, fiscal position or, for example, any ease for businesses? And could you also give an idea, I know it will be difficult at this time, but could you give an idea of the economic growth or decline, as you say, that we should expect for this year in light of the COVID pandemic? All right, as you would appreciate, uh, it's, this is a, a very fluid situation that we're in. It's fluid in terms of the healthcare issues, but it's also very fluid in terms of economic developments. What we are constantly doing and we are constantly revising our numbers as uh, developments emerge, what we're constantly doing is revisiting those forecasts to see how significant the fallout will be. Uh, clearly, it depends on several factors. It depends on what happens internationally. Uh, it depends on what happens uh, dom domestically. Uh, last night, the Prime Minister would have outlined a gradual uh, reopening of the domestic economy, which hopefully will help to uh, enable us to recover on some of the revenues that we may have foregone uh, in, in, in recent weeks. Uh, the, the idea of new measures is something that has to be looked at over time. Uh, what the uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance did last night was to introduce some measures in order to help uh, both the individuals and, and the private sector to be able to get through this crisis. Because what is critical for us is that we have to be able to uh, have companies that are strong enough to rebound from, from this activity. At the same time, we have to find a balance because that balance needs to ensure that government is able to finance its activities over time. So uh, in, in the press statement, I, I noted that our response so far had been measured and we have now wrapped it up some more. And we're able to do that because we are in a better position knowing what resources we are going to be able to get from the international financial institutions in order to provide budgetary support during this period. Uh, it's not simply a, a question of being able to have uh, sort of give back measures if you're unable to finance them. You, you have to be able to finance whatever it is that you plan to do. Uh, and that is a, a critical aspect of the macroeconomic management that we have to make sure that we have adequate financing to deal with it. So the, the availability of financing, in a sense, will also influence the nature of what measures you take uh, going forward, whether it is the speed at which you can increase expenditure, or if perchance you need to look at how do you recover uh, some uh, revenues in order to finance that expenditure. You would appreciate that this is not a time where we want to be 
uh, imposing new uh, tax measures, for example, because what you want to be able to do is to give uh, businesses and individuals an opportunity to recover from this economic shock. So the, the, the broad answer is that it's a fluid situation. Uh, the, the critical thing is that we have to be able to manage our expenditures in such a way that we have adequate uh, financing available. But over time, we'll be able to better assess what are the precise measures we will need to take. And it may not be measures in 2020, 2021. It may be measures in 21, uh, 22, as we get uh, hopefully further away from the crisis. But we begin to uh, rebuild uh, the economy at that point in time. Governor Haynes, Andre Springer from the Barbados Advocate. As you mentioned earlier, the world is likely to be a different place and there's likely to be paradigm shifts. Um, what would you say to those who believe that this is the perfect time to revisit CARICOM and a single Caribbean currency and increasing trade between islands? Well, the, the general principle, uh, we are a firm believer in the, the CARICOM mission. We believe that there are gains to be had for each of our individual countries. Uh, a lot of what CARICOM has succeeded at over time has been the functional cooperation, but there is scope, I think, for increased economic uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, that is something that we have been looking at, uh, whether it is true or, well, the, in terms of functional cooperation, we think of things like air services and, and, and so on. The, the whole question of trying to increase trade, uh, the one of the issues that clearly has arisen in this scenario is we, we talked about food security, the, the whole question of supply lines being disrupted and you're not being able to get stuff perhaps from further markets. So therefore we need to be able to have that trade to the extent that we produce goods and services in the region. We also need to be able to see the extent to which we can leverage trade between our, our various uh, countries. So, you know, you have no argument uh, certainly with me on the whole question of increased uh, collaboration within uh, CARICOM, strengthening the CARICOM process. Uh, I think we do very well on functional services, but we haven't perhaps done as well on some of the economic issues. Not all, but some of the economic issues. Now, the issue of the common currency has always been a, a trickier issue to, to deal with. And there's, there's an extent to which increased trade and the common currency will perhaps go hand in hand. The truth is that we don't have a lot of CARICOM uh, interregional trade. Uh, the, 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 the common currency is designed to help reduce the transaction costs as we move from one island to, to the next island. And there's always a chicken and egg situation. But I would argue that the, the absence of substantial uh, trade flows has meant that the the need for a common currency is not as pronounced as it would be if we had a lot more trade flows within the region. So we have to work towards getting uh, increased trade flows. There may be those who may argue that if you had the common currency, you would get more, more trade flows. But I think, from my perspective, it maybe works the other way. Good morning, Governor. Sean Kamarat from The Nation. Um, we're, we're going up against two things here. First of all, your, your, your COVID-19 virus is a health crisis, but it also has major economic impacts. We're dealing with those external impacts, but at the same time, we're having to lock down the country and practice physical distancing. I'm wondering what you see as the main priority from an economic standpoint as we battle against those, those two things, the external factor and having to lock down the country where businesses are closed. What do you see as priority number one? Well, I think our, our, our priority, number one, has been the health of our people. Uh, at the end of the day, the economy can't function if our people are unwell. And if we are unable to contain the spread of the virus locally, then it will effectively bring uh, business to a halt because, you know, you won't be able to go to work or your colleagues won't be able to come to work and, and there's so much you won't be able to do. So we have to look at both things as the, 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 the lockdown as being part of the process of addressing the health issue 
as well as preparing the economy uh, for takeoff. The, the, the sooner we're able to address the health issue, the, the sooner we would be better placed to allow uh, business to reopen. And, and as you know, last night, the, the Prime Minister announced a, a number of uh, measures intended to uh, bring more persons back into the workforce because we need, we need people in the workforce. There, there's no doubt about it. But if we don't address the, the health issues, if we fail to address the health issues, then, you know, there will be no work. Good morning, Governor. This is Keith Gordon from Stratcom Network. Voice about data. Could you raise um, your voice a little? Minister Cado, last week, Minister Cado indicated that July looks like the, like the estimated like the estimated time that we could see a return to commercial flights uh, coming to Barbados. You mentioned that it's a little bit a little difficult to predict, but do you see her timeline as being realistic given what's taking place internationally? And two, you mentioned the need for us to become uh, the need for security. And what could be some of the likely incentives for farmers um, in this present climate? Okay. So on the issue of reopening borders, and obviously this is something that's being dealt with at uh, at the international level, you know, members of cabinet and so on. But the first thing we have to look at is being able to control the spread of the virus locally, and we have to monitor the spread of the virus internationally. And then the, there's the risk because different countries are progressing at different paces. Our big tourism sector is dependent on UK market, US market, Canadian market. Those are really our three big markets. So we have to monitor what is happening in, in, in those markets. I know that some of the consideration now is towards testing of persons before they leave their jurisdictions and possibly uh, some form of testing once they arrive in your jurisdiction because you still want to be able not to have persons coming in who will now, you know, you, you resolve your domestic issue and now persons who are unwell come in and bring that virus back into, into the system because you don't want a stop-start type, type approach. So a lot will depend both in terms of the progress being made abroad as well as on the mechanisms that are developed to test persons before and after their travel because once they want to go back into their country, there's also going to be the issue as to their country believing that they're safe to, to come back in. So there's a lot happening behind the scenes. I can't give you a specific time timeline. Clearly, the sooner, the better, but we have to let these things work out. Uh, you know, let health, the health systems do the talking in terms of how fast we can uh, resolve these issues. Hi. Governor, I, want, I want to take a look at the uh, government's spending. Mm -hmm. uh, with the dramatic reduction in the revenues, mm -hmm. and I know that the Prime Minister mentioned last night as well that we could expect to, that, that situation to worsen. What support or what options do you see for uh, continued support of government's spending in the near term, in the short term? Okay, so we're, we're working on the forecast at present. The, the, the Prime Minister outlined to you last night the, the magnitude of the loss in revenue that is currently anticipated. Uh, and that is something that we have to continue to monitor over time. And Government is looking at its own expenditure profiles. There are some additional expenditures which have to be made that were not contemplated a, a, a few months ago. And therefore, one of the first challenges that government has is to look to reprioritize existing expenditures. Are, are there things that they contemplated doing, they wanted to do, but are not absolutely essential at this point in time for them to do? And therefore, you can. Uh, redirect planned expenditure from those areas into the new areas that are now absolutely essential. Uh, I think that that is uh, program number one, and there's an ongoing review within uh, the public sector to see how they can reorder their priorities to ensure that we're able to keep an overall lid on spending while providing the funds needed to support those areas that 
need uh, supporting. So a, a good example would be is that we obviously have to spend more on healthcare now uh, coming out of this crisis, twofold. One, just because we are fighting the, the, the COVID battle, but secondly, because the revenues associated with some of the taxes, including possibly the health service contribution, are going to be lower than they would have been under ordinary circumstances. But we have to maintain our, our hospital and our healthcare services at a certain level because if, without that, everything falls down. So therefore, you're gonna to have to spend more money uh, from the public purse on, on healthcare. So can we find, it's not simply a question of increasing the expenditure, but can we find expenditures that we can shift from other areas to help that? The, the second point, and it goes back to the, what I, I mentioned earlier, is that we have been working with our international partners to identify additional budgetary support to help us through this period. Uh, and we believe that we have the, the, the budgetary support uh, lined up that will enable us to be able, even with the reduced revenue, to be able to get through this phase. Does this mean that we don't have to make adjustments? I don't think so. It, it just means that we, we have to be very focused in where our spending is going to be, given that the revenues are going to decline and the truth be told, uh, we are not totally sure as to what the magnitude of those declines are, are going to be. Uh, clearly, we've, you know, we, we've developed uh, an economic outlook that says, if this, then, then this. But we also have to be prepared at the back of our mind, if this is actually worse than we thought it would be, then what? And so we're constantly trying to build alternative scenarios that will better enable us to be able to get through this, this crisis. I think the, and, I, and, the, and the Prime Minister alluded to it last night, the good thing is that we are, I said in a better place, I don't know if I want to say a good place, in a better place than we were 18, 24 months ago because of you know, the, the work in trying to bring uh, the fiscal back into some sense of, of, of normalcy. So by having done that, I think it has better enabled us to be able to address the, the challenges and also we, we have an increased level of reserve buffers uh, which will enable us to be able to withstand the, the significant shock that we're going to face by reduced earnings from, from travel credits. So that, that is going to help us, but we obviously have to be proactive in some of the measures that we take to ensure that we are able to maintain the balance going forward because we don't, we don't, while we're going to reduce the primary surplus in 2021, we don't want to end up undoing all of the good work that has been done over the last few years. Uh, Governor, in your presentation, you made reference to the dramatic drop in oil prices. The last few weeks, you made a, a, a reference to that dramatic drop in oil prices. I think at one point, you even said that a roll of toilet paper probably costs more than a barrel of oil. Um, but the thing is that reality here is that we haven't been seeing that at the gas pump and in some of our fossil fuel related entities like mm -hmm. electricity and so on. Um, when do you foresee that perhaps we may see some of those good or important prices impacting the island? Right. So what, what you would appreciate is that Oil is often purchased sort of ahead of time. So I will say to someone, uh, I want to buy oil three months from now. And they will give me a price that three months from now, the price is going to be $40. Okay? Because you, you have what you call spot prices and you have future prices. So spot price is the price you get to pay for on that given day. Future price is the price that you pay you, you, you're making a contract to buy it three months from now, so that's the price you're going to pay for it. Sometimes that price will go down. Sometimes that price will go up. The price will be better when you actually get delivery, but you've already contracted for it at the higher price. So that's the price that you will actually have to pay. So as you make new orders, you get the better prices with their lag. So my expectation is that in a month or two, you will begin to see 
uh, some decline in, in, in some of these these prices. Uh, whereas, you know, you, the prices that you're seeing now are probably prices for things that happened uh, back in January or February. Governor, if I may jump in here now, because we're getting a few questions online, and mm -hmm. of course, we want to encourage members of the public to send us your questions, and the governor has agreed to accommodate you. We have two questions so far. The one is, how will, the first one, sorry, is how will our GDP be affected by this crisis? And the second one speaks to the banks lending to central government. The person wants to know how much we've lent to government since 2018. <laughs> okay, uh, let's deal with the easier one first, which is the, the GDP. Uh, as I indicated in the uh, release, we expect our GDP to contract during 2020. Uh, the forecasts are quite, quite fluid, but uh, I think we are currently working with uh, like a, a 12 or 13 percent decline uh, in in GDP for 2013 for 2020. Uh, this obviously is something that we have to keep constantly monitoring. The the big impact here obviously is the loss of of tourism, and so that number will in a sense hinge a lot on how quickly. Uh, tourist arrivals start to rebound. And, when, and even when tourist arrivals start to come back, they're not going to suddenly come back to the level that they were at in 2019. We anticipate that when they do start to come back, it's going to be a, a gradual rebound. It's not that you're going to, let's say using the, the example earlier of flights from coming in from July, it's not that in July you will suddenly have 30 or 40,000 tourists uh, back on, on the island. So. Whenever it starts, it's going to be a gradual rebound, and therefore we anticipate a quite significant decline in the uh, economy for 2020. But it's something that we have to keep revising because the economic conditions are changing uh, all the time. The, the fact that business is starting back uh, from, from next week is a, a positive sign because some of the activity that would have been curtailed, for example, in construction, uh, that will uh, hopefully be able to start back next week and that will have uh, an important uh, impact because there are a number of investment projects that have been identified and if these projects are able to get going uh, in the next few months, that will help to cushion the impact, the, the adverse impact of the tourism fallout. So there, there are so many moving parts that I don't want to give you a specific number, but suffice to say that our best estimates right now is that we are going to have a double digit uh, decline in, 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 in GDP. And if we you know, can keep it to 10, 11% or so, we, we think that that would not be a bad outturn given the impact of the fall in tourism for 20. 20. You had a second question? Yes. How much money the bank has lent to oh, yeah. the government since 2018? That's a difficult question because I, I don't have it at the top of my head. What I would say, and you have to understand uh, government financing, since 2020, we've had a number of things. Um, one, one, of course, is that there was a substantial reduction in the amount of credit that the bank provided to government because of write-offs of, of the debt. So that would have uh, reduced the stock of uh, debt that the central bank was owed. But more generally, the, the government has been able to borrow from international financial institutions. And therefore, when they borrow from financial institutions, that provides the resources for them to be able to finance their activities. So by and large, what we are doing now is that we are providing sort of temporary flows of credit, but that is really, the, the, the finance is really coming from the resources. The, you have these large primary surpluses uh, up, up to this year. You had a large primary surplus. You have the inflows coming from the IDB and the CDB, and those are being used to finance the amortization and the interest of government. On a net basis, 
I think, I have a check in but on a net basis, we probably uh, are not a net lender to government. We're a, a net debtor, net creditor uh, as a result, because I think we, the surpluses and the inflows at this time are greater than the amortization and the interest payments that we, we have to make. But you will, see a, you will always see a balance um, on the ways and means account because we don't automatically transfer money from the deposits to the uh, ways and means account, so there will be a balance. And that balance, I believe, in early April uh, went down to zero. And since then, it would have gone back up, but it will fluctuate from, from time to time. And that's the important thing. Previously, the ways and means balance really wasn't fluctuating because the, the, the fiscal situation was so tight that it was always at a very high number. But what we've been able to do uh, with the improvement in the fiscal is to be able to allow the, the ways and means to fluctuate in the way that an overdraft that you have at the bank would fluctuate. Um, Governor, um, in terms of GDP, mm -hmm. hopefully we don't um, fall by that 12 to 30%. I know it's still a lot of uncertainty, but if that does happen, would that be a record fall in GDP for Barbados? And secondly, could you give us an idea on the amount of budgetary support that Barbados needs? Because you, you said that um, we'll be seeking and getting budgetary support from the International Financial Institution. Mm -hmm. Okay. As it relates to whether it's a, a record level, sort of a record level in my lifetime, um, obviously I can't speak to what may have transferred in the, in, in the pre-war pre days, but uh, this is a significant, this will be a significant contraction um, by any, certainly my professional career, we've never had a drop in GDP that went into double digits as far as I, I can recall. So this is quite a significant drop if we get into the double digit uh, area. As it relates to the, to the budgetary support, my, my recollection is that we're looking at magnitudes of probably the order of like 300 million uh, US uh, from the multilateral institutions, which will come over a, a period of time. You won't get all of it at, at once. Obviously, there are still some negotiations that need to take place, but I think it's of that ballpark because what you have done, as, as the Prime Minister announced last night, is that you have lost about 500 million, 550 million, I think was the figure she quoted, uh, between revenue and expenditure. So. In a sense, what we're trying to do is to recoup uh, that amount to enable us to make sure that we can uh, ride through this quite, quite smoothly. And what, what it will do for us is that it, in the short term, it will raise uh, our, our stock of debt. And then over time, we will be able to uh, repair the situation through uh, focused fiscal consolidation. Governor, I want to go back to my second question that wasn't asked earlier because we didn't mention the need for food security at this time. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what are the incentives likely to be for the agricultural sector as well as specifically the farmers uh, to ensure that that sector can certainly um, function on its even scale. The agricultural sector faces, what well, we, we have to face a number of challenges. One of which, and perhaps one of the critical ones, which the Prime Minister highlighted, is the whole question of predial larceny. Uh, you can grow your crops, you can get uh, reasonable prices for them, and you know, people are farming all the time, they're, 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 they're making income. But the one thing that I hear constantly is the issue of predial larceny. And if we are unable to address that, then we don't create the environment that creates the incentive. That, that, in a sense, removes a lot of the incentive if you are faced with predial larceny. So it does one or two things. It either pushes you out of the market and or it pushes up the prices that you are selling at because you want to raise your prices to compensate for the fact that you might lose on another crop. And therefore, you, you, you want really to address the issue of predial larceny so as to level the playing field, you have a greater degree of certainty. If I produce this crop at, I don't know, 80 cents a kilogram, 
and I want to sell it at a dollar a kilogram, I can be assured that in March, in June, in September, I can get that one dollar uh, a kilogram. It will get variations because of weather conditions and, and so on. But, but basically, what I'm saying is you want that reliable supply to the domestic market. It means that if there is, if there are competing products, because you have an assured supply at a reasonable price, you're better able to compete also with products that may be coming in. Because remember, they have larger scale than, than you do. Okay? So for me, the, 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 one of the biggest issues, probably not the sole issue, is the issue of premium larceny. We will have to look at some of the input prices because, as you would recognize, our culture also depends on inputs, fertilizers, and so on. And one will have to look to see the extent to which one can improve the competitiveness of those, those prices. I'm not sure if that will have to be addressed through tax incentives or, or what have you. But I think a major issue for, for, for our culture generally uh, is going to be trying to address this issue of predial larceny. Now, no, I, I know the Prime Minister spoke somewhat to this last night about her administration being um, willing to do whatever it takes to help the NIS. Uh, but with the thousands of unemployment claims that we are now seeing, mm -hmm. I want to get your perspective. And this is a two-part question. Um, how soon can we expect this to be running thin and we could start worrying or do something about it? And what support is there for the NIS? Can you repeat your first question? You, you broke up a little bit. How soon can you expect uh, the resources of the NIS to start running thin, especially the unemployment fund? Well, I think as you say, the, the unemployment fund does not itself have a lot of uh, financial resources. The NIS as an entity does, but the unemployment fund uh, has a very small buffer at this time. Uh, what is envisaged, as outlined last night, is for an early repayment of the, the bonds which the NIS has. So by uh, repaying those bonds, you provide more liquidity to them to enable them to be able to meet uh, the, the challenge that they face. And the expectation is that that will be addressed in the next uh, couple of weeks because uh, you have a substantial demand on the NAS now, uh, you want to cover the, the claims for this month, but then you still have then to look for the May and June. Now, so that's one aspect of it. I think the, the aspect though which offers hope is that a number of these persons who are claiming unemployment insurance now will be claiming because of the shutdown in economic activity. So as economic activity begins to open back up, some persons who are maybe getting claims in April and maybe May will no longer need to get claims, uh, to get funds from the NAS because they will be back to work. And I think, uh, so we're trying a, a number of programs. Uh, I think the Prime Minister spoke to the situation where there may be persons who uh, are working three days a week, but the NAS then supplementing their income for the other two days a week. So there, there are a number of things that we are sort of juggling, but the, the point is we have to be able to take care of this mass of persons during this uh, particular uh, period uh, because you know, this is too large a number of persons to be, to be going without. And therefore, we're gonna do everything that we can to ensure that the NIS has the resources, the liquid resources, it's not so much uh, have the resources, but have the liquid resources to be able to address uh, this problem in the, in the short term. Uh, Governor, I, I don't know, remember if you made specific reference to this, but in, in, with regard to the international business sector, mm -hmm. I understand that we still have some entities on island that are still doing business digitally. They're still being able to get things done even though you have them in the shutdown. Oh, what kind of role do you see uh, that sector playing in this rebuilding effort, and, and especially in, in which areas of the idea? So, so the international business sector is critical uh, to our progress. 
as you know, they make a substantial contribution to our tax revenues. And the, the whole tax system has been revamped around the international business sector. We are hopeful that during 2021, we will begin to see some of the, the benefits of the, of the revisions to, to that sector. Clearly, the companies in the uh, international business sector can be impacted also by this global crisis because remember that they're trading. Uh, some of them have uh, you know, equities on their balance sheet and equity prices have been very volatile and so on. So there's the, there's the risk that they could make losses uh, during this period and, and, and losses made by them during this period will obviously impact uh, future tax uh, collections uh, as we go forward. So in, in a sense, what we, we want to be able to see from the, the global environment is an overall improvement such that global equity prices start to come back up and, and, and do not impair the sort of tax base of the Barbadian economy because, you know, our progress is dependent not only on what we do domestically, but also on what we do uh, from an international perspective. And we have been struck clearly by the tourism uh, sector, or the tourism sector has been struck during this crisis. Uh, international business is one of our other main foreign exchange earners, and it is important for us to be able to sustain the international business sector during this period so as to help uh, with the buffers that we need uh, to go forward. And, and depending on, on what is happening there would depend, therefore, on the actions that we need to take at the domestic level. Um, Governor, um, as you have highlighted more than once, thousands of people are currently unemployed, um, whether on short term or longer term. One of the issues, one of the concerns being raised by the public is this whole question of the price of food and fears of price gouging. Is there anything that can be done, or do you have any concerns in relation to an escalating cost of living at this time? And are there any policy recommendations you can make, perhaps including some form of price control? The, this is something where we have to work together. Uh, and therefore, the concept of price, con, price gouging is anathema to the idea of us working together to get us through this, this period. Uh, we cannot take advantage of those who are less able during a period like, we shouldn't do it normally, but we certainly should not do it during a period uh, like this. So to the extent that there are anecdotal stories of persons raising prices on Julie, I think that it is a practice that needs to be stopped. Uh, more generally, uh, I'm not a fond advocate of uh, price controls because price controls are very difficult to implement because each firm does not acquire its goods at the same price. Often you are impacted by the volumes of the goods that, you, that you're buying, but certainly you do have markups that you apply and therefore one would like to think that firms are not going to apply excessive markups to the to the items that they have for sale at this point in time uh, and, and you, you really have to, to think about it the more that you do it uh, you probably are going to shoot yourself uh, in the foot because the more of a person's income that you take away now the less that is going to be available for them uh, in in the future so I would want to discourage anyone who uh, thinks that that is a practice in which they ought to engage uh, from so engaging uh, at this point in time. Governor, uh, you mentioned earlier about accelerating towards the renewable energies and alternative energy. And you also mentioned the significant upfront costs. But while businesses are able to afford that upfront cost, how realistic do you think it is for individuals to move towards renewable energy? Well, I think some individuals have started to do so. Uh, hopefully more will, I think. Uh, and, and it's not something that changes overnight. I think that new structures that are going up need to embrace uh, renewable energy up front. And that way you can spread the cost of it across your, your, your mortgage. Uh, I think there are going to be 
situations where perhaps corporates are going to put up structures which enable you to feed in so you don't have to make the actual investment but as a country the investment is made and you then you can pay for it uh, over time so there are a number of ways in which this can become a reality uh, the, the important thing is that as a country we have to accept that this is a direction in which we we have to go and whether it is being done at the corporate level being done at the individual level then it's going to benefit not only us as individuals, but it's also going to benefit the country uh, eventually. You would have seen in the chart that we, we have a, a significant uh, oil import bill. And what we want to be able to do is to reduce that oil import bill over time, both from, uh, as I say, protecting the environment, which is, is very important, but also if we can think of reducing the amount of uh, outflows of foreign exchange, you know, a, a dollar save is almost the same as a dollar earned, and, and that is what we're going to need uh, going forward. Governor, we have a couple more questions from the public. I'll start with this one. Landlords have been encouraged to defer or waive rents for their tenants. Will any support or payments be provided for such landlords? I'm not currently aware of a program for, for landlords. Uh, you know, this is a difficult, this is a difficult situation, uh, and therefore, we, we need landlords and tenants really to work with each other uh, through this through this period. It's an issue that I know that we will have to discuss further in terms of what can be done. Uh, resources are not, you know, there to do everything for everyone. But well, we, we are conscious of the fact that for some landlords, this is their source of income. And therefore, we have to look to see if there is anything that can be done in those circumstances. But it's, it's, the, the, the point is, is that they're not an infinite set of, of resources to be able to address all of the issues immediately. But over time, we are looking to see how best we can address issues of a hardship that may arise during this, this period of time. And uh, this other question from a member of the public, uh, what is your view of taking money out of the catastrophe fund with hurricane season around the corner, not knowing if a hurricane may strike? Okay, I think the Prime Minister uh, addressed this issue uh, in her presentation last night. And the point that she was making was that under our debt restructuring, we introduced clauses that provide that if there is a climatic event that causes us to uh, have to get recourse from CRIFS, which and CRIFS is a uh, an agency that provides funding in, in such events, then we will be able to reduce our spending on debt service for up to two year period. And the, the amount of savings that she quoted, I think were of the order of 1.7 billion over a two year period, such that if you had an event, you would, the fiscal space would be created for you at that point in time and you would not have to rely on the proceeds in the catastrophe fund. So I think we need to look at the catastrophe fund as a more long-term issue. But during this window, if we do have a, a, an, an event, then we do have recourse, if we so elect, to be able to postpone debt service payments at that point in time. And that is what gives you uh, the the space to do the things which the uh, caller uh, obviously wants us to be able to address. So from that perspective, I think it's uh, something that is manageable. Uh, clearly, what we would not hope is that on top of this crisis that we have a climatic event on top of it, but I think that we, we have, when everything is considered, uh, the precautions in place to be able to address that particular issue. Okay, thanks. We have uh, three more questions from the media, and then we'll wrap. Thanks. Um, Governor, I want to take you back. My, my final question is kind of a 
follow on to the, a question from social media earlier, earlier on, and that has to do with central bank funding of government. Um, can you give us an update on where we are at in terms of the recapitalization of the central bank, given that it took a significant loss in the debt domestic debt restructuring? And secondly, is central bank financing of government an option currently on the table if perhaps the situation deteriorates and government needs more funding um, to run its operation? Is that still an option? Okay. So as it relates to the recapitalization, uh, as you're aware, we've committed to developing a plan for the recapitalization of the bank. Originally, it was intended that we would develop that plan by the end of June. Uh, as you would appreciate, COVID has shifted the focus of everyone elsewhere, uh, us at the bank, the government, the IMF, and what we propose to do is to actually push back uh, that benchmark under the program. The, the bank continues to function. It has the ability to meet its obligations. Uh, so we, we do need to get the recapitalization in place. But at this point in time, it is taking uh, you know, second priority to try to deal with the COVID-related issues. As it relates to increased central bank financing, that is something that we have to look at. As you know, one of the early actions of the new administration was to reduce the amount of lending that the central bank could provide uh, to government as part of its ongoing commitment to run a, a very tight ship. I think the circumstances that we face may force us to relook at that, but we have to look at it in the context of the overall program and any, any revisiting would have to be time bound. In other words, it would have to be temporary for a period of time to get us through this, this period and not for a sustained increase in central bank uh, financing. So it's something that we have to look at, uh, bearing in mind the, the timing of flows that we expect to be able to help us get through the, the, this period. So sometimes you may not get the flow exactly at the point in time when, when you need it, but over time, and, and that's what the, the value and the virtue of, of having the program is, that you are able to say, well, this is my target, this is my fiscal target, with this target, I anticipate that this is going to be my reserve outcome, and therefore I can accommodate this level of financing from the central bank during this period in order to achieve these specific targets. Uh, and that is a slightly different approach where it becomes open-ended and there's no sort of specific target in mind, and you know what happens in, in that situation. We've experienced it, and therefore uh, we would not want to go back there. But I would have to be honest with you and say that we do have to look at the issue of uh, additional central bank financing, but it has to be time bound. In other words, it's for a particular period of time and it will have to be obviously receive the blessing of parliamentary approval if we are going to go that route. Um, two quick questions, Governor. I want to get your take on any likely changes that we can expect to labor laws in light of the pandemic. And secondly, could you shed some more light on the imminence of the credit union um, joining the automated uh, clearinghouse? Mm -hmm. You mentioned this earlier this yeah. year, and what's the holdup? Okay. I'm not in a position to speak on the labor laws. I think you will have to speak to the Minister of Labor and or the Chief Labor Officer. Uh, generally, I think we are in a dynamic situation uh, where persons are now working from home. And the, most of my staff uh, is actually working from home and I, I always have to commend them because we have been able to maintain a fair degree of our services uh, by working from home, which in some cases we did not think was possible until this arose and therefore it has been quite enlightening as to what we can do from home. Some of them, some of them in close proximity, I think would like to be able to work from home uh, forever. But, you know, we have to make sure that the environment is right. 
we, I don't think you want to develop a system that is too rigid. Uh, there needs to be flexibility for both employer and employee. Uh, and you know, what constitutes a work day, what, you know, what are the, the conditions that must attend. There, there are obviously issues of health and safety that arise in the situations where you're working from home. Uh, who's going to make the investment. There, there are a number of things that one has to look at, but I think it is a trend that is likely to continue, not necessarily to the same extent as we have it at present, but it is a trend that is likely to continue where more and more persons can, can work from home. Uh, those are my officers who work from home. Uh, many of them are saying they're working harder now because you know they get up early, start to work, and they're at it all day, uh, in some cases uh, all night. So there, there, there are trade-offs, but we have to make sure that the situation being as dynamic as it is, that it doesn't become too, too rigid on, on either side. Uh, your second question again was? The two credit unions. Oh, the two credit unions. Two credit unions that will be joining the ACH. Right, so we've had some delays in, but we have recently written uh, to the credit union movement indicating that we are ready for them to join uh, the ACH. Obviously there are some things that they have to do, they have to acquire the technology and so on to be able to come in. Uh, we had hoped that they would come in because we are in the process of changing the technology in, in the, in the uh, press release you would have seen reference to the fact that we want to be able to go to real time uh, direct debit payments and we were hoping that they could come in at the same time. As with everything else, there have been delays uh, in that. So we have basically uh, said to the, to the credit unions, you know, let's go. And you can always transition from the old system to the new system. So we are really waiting now on the feedback uh, from the credit unions. And there are a few technical issues that they have to resolve. But I'm hopeful that within this quarter, the credit unions will be able to come on board and to be able to execute the, the direct debits uh, which they uh, want to do. Uh, Governor, my question relates to the Prime Minister's uh, revelation last night about the central banks uh, meetings now for the commercial banks as it relates to uh, fees. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that she said that there are some things that are going to happen, particularly for the seniors. Uh, but just if you can elaborate a little bit on what the bank will be doing going forward. No, she did mention that you are publishing uh, fees and so on as well. Just a little, right. Give a little bit more on what's involved. Right. So we, we have been in discussions uh, with the commercial banks on this matter of fees. Uh, there have been a number of complaints that we, we have received. Uh, and as I said in my speech, I think back in, in February, to, the, to Berefa, my concern is that very high fees could lead to some form of financial exclusion of some people uh, from the financial system. Clearly, within the financial system, you have banks and you have other financial institutions, including the credit unions. Uh, individuals do have a choice of institutions uh, to which they will utilize. And perhaps even more critically, they have choice of the sort of instruments that they would use to uh, conduct their transactions. So, for example, what we have discussed with the banks is the need to ensure that uh, own ATM transactions, uh, direct debits, um, electronic transfers, online transfers, that these remain free because the, the, the banks have invested in technology, trying to encourage people, and some, and some of their fees, quite honestly, are designed to be a disincentive for people to behave in certain ways. And, and it's not so much for the revenue that they want, but they want really to be able to push persons in certain directions. And, and the, the way that they've sought to do so is to uh, impose fees for certain activities. So you go over the counter, you have to pay for going over the counter, because quite honestly, the bank wants you to use the ATM, okay? Um, so it therefore becomes a choice as to whether or not you're going to go over the counter and if you're going to go over the counter that's a decision that you've sort of taken and therefore you've decided uh, from the bank's perspective at least that you're willing to pay 
uh, that over the, over the counter fee. But there must be, in, 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 in my view, uh, avenues for persons to be able to have uh, no fee transaction uh, media, and I just outlined to you uh, three such uh, possibilities. The, the one issue that obviously has been of grave concern has been the whole question of um, the maintenance account fees. And our discussions with the banks have yielded uh, concessions from them in terms of what they charge for seniors, what they charge for juniors, and they have also agreed to waive the, the fees on uh, over-the-counter transactions for seniors over, over 70, because we recognize that there could be a technological uh, issue there with, with such persons, but generally it is to try to get persons to move towards uh, other uh, forms of, of, of banking. Have we gotten fully where we want to be? I wouldn't say that we have, and therefore the dialogue has to continue. Uh, the, the point is that this is a very difficult period, even for the banks. As you know, we, we've asked them to uh, introduce the moratorium and to forego uh, liquidity and so on during, during this period. Uh, but more critically, we're not sure what the, the, the nature of this uh, crisis will have on the banks themselves. And that's something that we, we have to manage. Uh, but we cannot relax. We have to remain vigilant. Uh, so what we have said, uh, and, and the Prime Minister outlined uh, last night, is that the, the banks have to make sure that their customers are fully aware of what their prices are uh, for whatever services. They have to, if they're making changes, they have to make sure that their customers are fully aware because your decisions will be influenced by what you know about the institution uh, that manages your money. And, and we, as a central bank, uh, and Ernie, I've, I've, I've advocated for this for a long time, so I suppose it's come back to, to haunt me. We are going to publish uh, at least twice a year the comparative uh, fees for certain basic services. It's not, obviously, it's not going to be everything, but certainly those fees that impact the, the average consumer so that you can see what your bank is charging you versus what other banks are charging. And, and that also will help you to make your determination as to whether or not these are services that you want to get from your bank. The, 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 the thing about banking services, as with, with any services, is that it's a bundle. So the price of X is higher here than it is there, but the price of Y may be lower here. So you have to make those decisions as to where you want to be able to, to do uh, your, your banking. But we will um, continue to monitor uh, these developments and to uh, maintain this dialogue with the banks because we, we want to make sure that at the end of the day, we do not create a system where people are unwilling to place their funds in the financial system because they feel that you know you, you, you put $1,000 in and when you look back, it's only $900. And, and that, to my mind, cannot be what we want uh, our system of financial intermediation uh, to achieve. So it's, it's a work in progress, but we will continue to uh, deal with the situation as we go forward. So thank you very much, Governor, and thanks to members of the media. We have one more question from the public, and before you give your wrap, we ask you to please respond to it, Governor Haynes. And the person is simply asking us to share with them how many persons have actually opened uh, foreign currency accounts. Oh, I am not in a position to give you an answer to that question. It's something that we can research and get back to you. What I can say is that initially there was not a big increase in the number of entities that uh, open foreign currency accounts. And, and, and that's for, for various reasons. What I did note is that there seems to have been a pickup in the balances for foreign currency accounts at the end of March. Uh, my, my conversations with the bankers have suggested that they have not been any, they have not noted any significant increases in the number. So it may just be that 
one or two uh, large foreign currency holders have increased their balances. But that's something that we, we I think, can explore and perhaps uh, inform you at a, at, a, at a later date as to what the rate of growth of new account holders is like. Okay. So, in closing, what I want to leave with you is that I've shared with you what I think is a rather sobering outlook of what we now face in 2020. The truth is that none of us knows how sharp the downturn will be. What we do know is that it will test our resilience as a people as we confront the challenges it presents. Fortunately, we do have some buffers, economic and importantly personal, with which we can fight this battle. We need to use these buffers carefully and pointedly to help those most in need and to ensure that we can come through this crisis better prepared and less vulnerable to economic or climatic shocks. At the same time, we need to recognize that even the mighty can be fallen by events such as this, and we must be prepared to help wherever and whenever we can. Government last night announced a series of measures designed to alleviate the potential economic distress. But government cannot do it alone. This is a time for all of us to work together to take us safely to shore. Our ultimate success depends on our cooperation and collaboration. We can do this. Stay safe. And uh, yes, we can. Thank you very much, Governor Haynes. Thanks to the members of the media, to the technical team, and of course, to the public who tuned in to this news conference this morning. We encourage you to visit our website at centralbank.org.bb, especially those persons who love details and numbers. We have a fuller text of the economic outlook, forecast, and review there on our website. As our governor said, we can do this, and let us be each other's keeper. Stay safe and adhere to all protocols. Now is not the time to drop our guard. I thank you and we love you from the Central Bank of Barbados. Have a wonderful day.